what a <laughs> fragile thing democracy turned out to be. Um, I am referring actually to the time that I'm transporting you to this evening, which was uh, the 30s in Washington, D.C., when, um, when once before our nation was really on the brink of um, revolution, it might have been, had it not been for the dynamic and optimistic leadership of, uh, of President Roosevelt. Today, of course, um, we have a, a, a different and, uh, and equally dramatic scenario playing out in Washington. And in fact, um, the, the, the raspy voice that you hear, I've had since election night. <laughs> and, and I think it will be with me until the next election. election. So please, please forgive me. I can't seem to shake this, uh, this virus. Um, so what I'd like to do is, is, is uh, plunk you in the middle of this rather astonishing, uh, Le Carre couldn't have made this up, uh, story, which it was my very good fortune to, uh, to uncover um, a missing chapter from the history of the Cold War. And I want to take you there um, in full uh, flight um, so that you get the, the atmosphere of the story. I write... Um, Nonfiction, but but I tell stories. It's narrative nonfiction, and I I I spare you the documentation until the very end, um, so so as not to disturb the flow. In May 1949, an American of patrician bearing, with the slight stoop of a tall man, walks the streets of Prague. <coughs> Though Nolfield appears aimless and unhurried, he is not a tourist. Tourists are scarce in Prague during the second year of Soviet rule. And foreigners, especially Americans, even more rare. Czechs passing field avoid eye contact with a man so obviously from the enemy camp. They have no way of knowing that this elegant man with the long aquiline features is a Soviet agent. The American is in Prague because he has nowhere else to go. For two decades, Field has lived a double life. Noel Field is unaware that his life as a traitor is about to be brutally ended, not by the country he betrayed, the United States, but by the one he serves, the Soviet Union. As always in his life replete with terrible choices, Field is focused on the rightness of the one he has just made. He has come east to escape an FBI subpoena. Field knows and loves the medieval city on the Latava River and tries now to let Prague work its timeless magic on his agitated spirit. On the surface, the quiet streets below the immense castle seem unchanged. Prague has been spared the bombing that destroyed so many other ancient European cities during the recent World War. Though the great Baroque and Gothic monuments stand undisturbed, Prague's spirit has been snuffed out. An eerie stillness hangs over the town. People in the streets do their business, then hurry home. No carefree laughter wafts from the cafes off Wenceslaus Square to break the quiet. This is not the old Prague. Noel Field, however, has the gift of seeing only what he chooses to see. As the days pass, Field play, pays ever less attention to the statues of Baroque saints lined up like sentries on either side of the Charles Bridge. The prematurely gray-haired American shambles unseeing among these architectural wonders. Daily he passes 22 Golden Lane, Franz Kafka's house in the old city. Out of habit, he still pauses before the Gothic tower of the old town hall, but he's no longer mesmerized by the hourly appearance of death clanging its bell to mark the time. How strange that so many friends, comrades from the Spanish Civil War and the Communist International, <clears throat> whom he had helped in so many ways, were too busy or out of town. Yet they had encouraged Field to come to Prague, held out the prospect of a teaching job at the famed Charles University. When he hears nothing more about the job offer that lured him here, does he have a premonition some sense that he is about to embark on his own Kafkaesque journey. 
Did the seasoned spy realize that his every step in the old town is shadowed? The American's bland, expressionless features do not quite mask his anxiety. Secrecy from even friends and family was hardwired into Field. Recently, Field's secret exploded in articles in his own country's front pages. Whitaker Chambers, a confessed Soviet spy, named Noel Field in his Senate testimony about communists in, communists in the highest reaches of the U.S. government. The New York Times revealed still more details in its coverage of the trial of Noel's friend and fellow spy, Soviet, Soviet agent Alger Hiss. With dread mounting, Noel had read those accounts at his home in Geneva. He admired his friend Alger's smooth deception under oath, but he knew he was incapable of such a performance. One step ahead of an FBI subpoena, Noel fled to the presumed safety of Prague. Field could not know that the Kremlin had chosen him for a key role in the upcoming purge of Stalin's would-be enemies. The fact that Field was Stalin's loyal foot soldier was irrelevant. Noel Field, who knew all those targeted by Stalin for liquidation and was a citizen of the new enemy, would make the perfect witness against them. Starting in 1949, the paranoid Soviet leader prescribed a fresh wave of terror and show trials with Noel Field, his faithful acolyte, at their center. Field's idle stroll through the ancient city would be his last as a free man. So this is where the story begins, the trap that's, uh, that's set by Moscow on one of its most faithful adherents. But the story really goes back a decade, uh, which is when Field's radicalization, self-radicalization, began as a student at Harvard. Uh, Field was born into privilege. Uh, he was the son of an eminent biologist, and he was an idealist and a very good human being, at least at the outset. And one of the important uh, takeaways of, of True Believer it is, is that it isn't enough to just want to do good in the world. You also need to have judgment. And judgment he sorely lacked. And unbeknownst to Field, he was recruited, talent spotted, I should say, by the Kremlin as he rose in the State Department, a brilliant young Foreign Service officer. He, he went through uh, Harvard in two years. He, he had everything to look forward to and landed his dream job in the Office of Western European Affairs in the State Department. And, um, and he was precisely the sort of man that, um, that, that Stalin's agents were hunting for, because who would believe that such a man, so well-bred, so well-spoken, so well-dressed, uh, would be a spy? And very much in the, in the nature of, uh, well, the Cambridge Five, uh, he was, quote-unquote, one of us, an entirely clubbable man. And therefore, they had uh, their eye on him, because he, not only was he was he clubbable, but he was also alienated from his own country. And by the way, there was a great deal to be alienated from. Um, then as now, our country was deeply divided. Uh, unemployment was stratospherically high after, after the recent depression, 11 million unemployed. Racism was rampant. Um, Noel Field made a habit of befriending African Americans, which was not considered a career advancer, uh, he would he would invite them home to dinner. He, there were so many things about the man that 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 are noble and and likable, and that in part made his story interesting for a writer. I don't. Uh, I, I, I didn't realize that I carved out a niche for myself as, as the biographer of people who meet gruesome ends, but um, I guess there is um, something to that. Um, it's true that, that, um, that I like to, uh, I frankly feel that history is too important to be left to historians, and, and therefore I like to take uh, chunks of history and... and uh, through one fairly obscure character, tell a larger tale, because I think that we understand events 
much more readily and feel them more deeply through a life, through a specific human experience rather than you know, memorizing uh, battles and, and monarchs that come and go and prime ministers, etc., through, through human beings. And I suppose I've, I've done that. Um, certainly I did that with the book on George Polk and telling the story of the Cold War, Raoul Wallenberg in, in um, telling the story of the, of the Hungarian Holocaust. And, um, and now um, Noel Field, the, the unknown anti-hero of, uh, of the Cold War. And I don't want to give away the whole story because despite W.H. Smith's best efforts, I really hope that you will find uh, your way to a copy. Um, but I do want to say that, um, that, the, that the theme, or the core of this book is really the power of an idea. And the and the the power of uh, demagogues, and this is where it uh, the book has become far more relevant than I imagined. Um, the power of demagogues to capture certain questing idealists looking for for quick, or even non-idealists, um, people looking for quick solutions to to everything, and impatient to uh, to burn the house down. Which is, which is what this communist cell that Noel Field joined in Washington, D.C. in the 30s was in training to do. The Communist Party was legal. <coughs> they were not Communist Party members, these people. They were not supposed to reveal, even to their own families, that they were agents of either, in, in uh, Noel Field's case, the KGB, or in his friend, uh, Alger Hiss's case, the, the um, GRU, the, the, the Soviet Military Intelligence Unit, they, they weren't even supposed to know them among friends which unit they were, they were in. So, so absolute secrecy was, was uh, expected of them. And what, what uh, makes Nolfield's story so remarkable and so unique is that, is that unlike most of the intellectuals, and I have to say that most uh, right-thinking people from, from um, Orwell to, to Kessler to Hemingway to, to um, um, Dorothy Parker, uh, you name it, um, Edmund Wilson, um, flirted or more with communism. But most of them, when they saw the huge gap between, between the promised utopia and the reality, um, clambered to safety. But not Noel Field, not not after the most brutal treatment, this, the, the, this journey that, that starts in Prague is only the very first step toward um, a, a nightmare, which not only did, was he submitted to, but his entire family, because they naively pursued him into the Gulag Archipelago. And you don't do that and live to tell the tale. The, the, uh, the, the breathtaking naivete of Americans about what was really going on in, in, in Stalin's Soviet Union is, it is really just that, breathtaking. So the, the way I came to this tale is, uh, is, is a very strange one, but uh, my parents were for a period in the same jail as, as Noel Field. In fact, my father was in the same cell. Uh, my parents, um, as I think Charlie mentioned, were... Um, Hungarian uh, journalist, but working for the Americans, which was not a really smart thing to be doing in, in the 50s and behind the Iron Curtain. And so after a while, they were both jailed and, and tried and convicted as CIA agents, which they were not. They were good reporters doing their work, as good reporters are trying to do their work today. And, uh, and frankly, I, I, uh, I think... Uh, good reporters need our support more than ever. Um, I, I, the work I do for the Committee to Protect Journalists is a direct result of, of what I witnessed as a child in, in, in my own house with my father working for the Associated Press, my mother for United Press. You can imagine what a harmonious <laughs> household that was. You know, with only one telephone. Uh, but, uh, um, I, I, they were they were brave and they they were very straight reporters and and then one day they weren't there any longer, 
but they covered Noel Field's show trial. And, and whatever we know of what happened in that show trial is as a result of uh, my mother and father's reporting. And the show trial was allegedly to weed out Titoists, whereas in the 30s, Stalin wanted to weed out Trotskyites. The new enemy was Tito, because Tito was, was way too independent for Stalin's uh, taste. And, uh, and so he had to, he had to, uh, he, he ordered up show trials in, in all the Soviet satellites. And Field was the chief witness because it, um, during the Spanish Civil War, which is, which is one of the pivotal uh, chapters in this book, because, because that was one of the hinge events for, um, of the 20th century and certainly for this generation. Um, he met all the future leaders of the, of the um, East Bloc states to their eternal chagrin. <laughs> because when, when uh, it came time for Stalin to target these people, Stalin was going after anybody who was quote unquote contaminated by too much time in the West. And Spain um, was the West. Um, and, and anyway, I, I, it's, it's hard for me not to give away the whole story, so, uh, but I would love to hear um, uh, your questions as well. Um, it, it's, it's a story that, that um, brings back an era when, when really the United States could have gone in a different direction, and, and, and people like Walter Lippmann, you know, the great, uh, the most eminent, pundit sage of his day, advisor to presidents, advised Roosevelt uh, to declare martial law and to because, because there was so much disruption in Washington and because thousands of World War I veterans were camped out in the Capitol, the, the famous bonus march, uh, because they'd been promised uh, bonus checks for their service in World War I and, and uh, they were ignored by by uh, Roosevelt's predecessor, Hoover. So they, uh, uh, not J. Edgar Hoover, but Herbert Hoover. <laughs> yeah. J. Edgar Hoover plays his role in this book too. J. Edgar Hoover um, it was caught flat-footed in the 30s uh, when, he was, when he was presented by um, the State Department security people with a list of, of communists in the, in the highest reaches of, of the government. Um, Hoover dismissed the list and said, we're, we're not interested, those guys are, are kooks, uh, we're, we're, hunting, we're hunting fascists. And Roosevelt had the same reaction. By the time they, that Hoover, um, with, with spurred on by, by Richard Nixon, started his witch hunt in the 50s, there were very few witches left, but in the 30s, the woods were full of them. Um, and so it, it, was, it was fascinating for me. I did most of my research um, in the KGB archives and in the Hungarian secret police archives. And, um, and of course, total surveillance of, of all these players uh, played a huge role in, in, me, in me putting this story together. But, but even more important than that, was that I found the surviving family members and they wanted to know what happened to So they opened their, um, their correspondence and, and uh, thus I was able to flesh out uh, this very enigmatic uh, character who at times I really was rooting for and at other times um, found just appalling and you will see that that the trajectory he makes from, from <coughs> wanting to save the world to uh, to being ready like an ISIS warrior like a jihadi fighter to do anything that was asked of him he was not asked to strap on a suicide vest but he was asked to participate in the assassination of, a, of an old Bolshevik hero and he agreed and and so this is really the the portrait of you know how one goes from from being a, uh, uh, a humanitarian to being the willing assassin of a of a monster, and it's really about the capture of minds and how difficult it is to let go of that um, that that uh, captivity uh, if it's done early enough. For for field to have 
um, let go of it, even after five years of jail and torture and the jailing of his wife and his brother and his daughter, um, would have meant an admission that his entire life had been a shambles, and he, he couldn't do that. But I'm happy to tell you that there is a heroine in this book. <laughs> and, and, you know, writing a book is kind of like a marriage. But, um, if you don't love your subject, it's really hard going. Uh, so I, um, I, I um, uh, jumped on the character of Erica, uh, Noel Field's adopted daughter. And uh, she was like a like a, a drink of fresh water after, after Nolfield. She was the anti Nolfield because she also, all, uh, he adopted her during the Spanish Civil War because her parents couldn't look after her, had big dreams for her, a uh, big future for her as a communist. Uh, she, uh, she was an a extremely headstrong young woman. She, when the State Department wasn't doing anything to try to find out what happened to Nolfield and his wife and his brother, uh, she went um, looking for him and, and got five years in the, in the northernmost outpost of the Gulag laying railroad tracks for five years. Mm -hmm. And this with, with two, uh, two little babies mm -hmm. um, that she handed to her um, GI husband. <coughs> so she comes out of um, the Gulag when, when they're all... Uh, released, pardon, Stalin is dead, Khrushchev is making nice with Eisenhower, and the, the man who interrogated, which is a euphemism for torture, all of them, himself defects, turns up in Washington, big news conference, says, these people are all alive, I know. And here, so at that point, Washington starts bombarding the Kremlin with demanding, <laughs> demanding um, information, <coughs> excuse me, about the Field family. And so they are released, and they all hightail it out of um, Soviet captivity, but not Noel, <coughs> because he doesn't want to face the music at home, even though by now the statute of limitations on spying would have, would have expired. But he doesn't have the energy. So he, he becomes, he's never free, really, because he becomes a propagandist um, for, for a government. And... Um, one of the conditions, excuse me for one second. We all have the trunk. Um, one of the conditions of his release is that he never talked to Western media about his ordeal because he's a wreck. He's a shell of his former self. And um, the only Western media ever to locate and interviewing were my mother and father. So I had their notes. So again, <coughs> um, a great piece of good fortune. Would you like some water? <laughs> I'm sure you want to share my <laughs> infected bottle. Um, so um, so <coughs> it's a story of, um, of the capture of minds and how dangerous it is. And I think it's... Um, I thought the relevance would be made. When I finished writing the book, I thought, and we were in the middle of this, uh, this insane election season, I, I thought, well, I'm going to write an essay, put it in the front of the book, making a connection between this brand of fanaticism and, and Islamic fanaticism. So there's an essay in the front called The Capture of Minds, where I connect, you know, that basically um, there is a certain type of individual who's susceptible um, to, um, uh, to, to dogma. But I did not then imagine <laughs> that we would have, once again, Moscow manipulating Washington to this extent, and, um, and that the book <coughs> would be um, entirely um, too, too relevant. Uh, which, you know, is good for book sales, but I'm sorry <laughs> about the rest of it. <laughs> anyway, I'll, I'll stop there um, because uh, I would love to hear your questions about anything, I mean, within bounds. Um, uh, great story. Thank you. Do you have an idea why Field, having had this privileged background, etc., yes. why he became a spy? Ah, why did he become a spy? Well, um, 
uh, he, he was alienated from his own country. He spent his early childhood in, in, um, in Zurich. Um, so the, his American roots were fairly shallow, though his, his family had been in the States since the 17th century. So deep Yankee roots, um, Quakers. Uh, so the do-gooder gene was there, as well as some may say the, the naive thing. Um, and um, he, he, he was looking, um, his, his father played a huge role in his life. His father was a very impressive uh, Victorian pater familias. And um, uh, before, um, when, when Noel was, was uh, 16 years old, his father took him to visit the still fresh um, battlefields of World War I, Verdun and the Marne and so on. And a devastating tableau, you know, with graves as far as the eye could see, and, and basically said to the boy, uh, make sure it doesn't happen again. The father dies shortly thereafter, and the moderating influence in the life is gone. Then the family picks up from Zurich, and, and, and he goes right to Harvard. He's alienated at Harvard because Harvard is a bastion of privilege, and he, can't, he doesn't fit in there, but so, you know, he just tears through... Uh, the academic life there brilliantly and is the youngest foreign service officer ever to, and with highest grade, but without having too many social skills. Um, he marries his childhood sweetheart who follows him from, from Zurich and, um, and that doesn't do him much good either because she's, she is uh, uh, relentlessly um, accommodating. She would have followed him to, you know, a Tibetan a monastery, if that had been his life choice. Um, so it, it doesn't enlarge his world one bit. And um, he's, he's, reading, he's reading all these beautiful Marxist and Leninist tomes. He's, he's, um, he subscribes to the uh, Daily Worker. He's learning Russian. Russia, the Russian propaganda uh, machine is, is extraordinarily effective. Uh, they really kind of invented uh, ideological spin. There's a, there's a great character in, in this book, which some of you may have heard of, called Willy Munzenberg, who operates out of Berlin. I, I remember him from my previous work on Arthur Kessler. He, Kessler worked for him, too. Uh, Munzenberg picks, um, picks Field as a, as a good prospect, as a kind of an unmoored, intellectual, uh, well-placed to rise fast, and, and sends a, um, a KGB <coughs> recruiter right out of a Raymond Chandler novel. Um, and when, she, when Hedy Massing rings his bell, he's ready. Um, and and um, he, he um, did, you know, some of you may want to know how much damage did he do? I mean, apart from crushing his family, which is damage enough. Um, you know, what did he actually get away with in terms of documents and secrets and so on. And he was useful to Stalin in, um, um, he presided, he, he was, he was a, a key player in the London Naval Disarmament Conference. And Stalin was trying to figure out what, if anything, Washington was doing to prepare for the coming war. And precious little, really, in the, in the early, in the 30s. And, um, and, and Field gave uh, very good information on that. And plus they used, it wasn't so much the, he, he also uh, profiled his, his, his colleagues and, and um, um, basically was awaiting instructions uh, when he got the one that he should help in the assassination of this hero. Um, basically, I think his biggest uh, role was um, in, in enabling Stalin uh, to uh, liquidate his foes by providing cover, by <coughs> providing uh, this confession, uh, which was beaten out of him, but, uh, but still, he, it was Noel Field. If any of you have ever seen the wonderful Costa Gavras film called The Confession with Yves Montand, Noel Field is all over that film, uh, I mean, his name, um, because... His testimony was the one that convicted not only the, the, um, um, the, the there, were, there were four show trials. The first one, the, the kickoff was in Budapest. The grand premiere was in Budapest, the one my parents covered. The foreign minister of Hungary was uh, executed as a result 
that was that. Um, uh, but then it, then it moved on to Prague, the Slansky trial, also very famous. And, and it was Field's testimony every time. And then, and then to Warsaw and then to East Berlin and so on. So he basically was responsible for hundreds of, of uh, loyal old time Bolsheviks um, meeting their meeting their end and well many other many other things but I'll um, the, the the remarkable thing is that that um, I you know I found people who who uh, remembered him from his time in Hungary he died he died in 1970 everybody thought he was in his 80s he was only in his 60s because he got so old but um, um, and I found one of his. Uh, he, he was he was put to work in a in a uh, so-called literary journal, Hungarian literary journal. Um, and and one of his colleagues said that after a, after the crushing of the Hungarian Revolution in 1956, which is when my parents found him, um, he he was an apologist. He uh, for uh, for Moscow crushing the freedom fight. But in, in 1968, when the same scenario happened in Prague, he went into a deep depression and at that point stopped paying his party dues. Um, but, um, but he never disavowed um, th that uh, the system, you know, this murderous system, he never uh, admitted that he'd made the, the wrong choice in his life. He kept. Uh, doing what was, and and he he was given a almost a state funeral when he died you know full complement of military you know people shooting off guns and all that and that that was in 1970 in Budapest in Budapest he's he's buried he and his wife are, are buried in Budapest and uh, people who who <clears throat> attended that funeral told me that that he had prescribed that that everybody sing the Internationale. But nobody remembered the words to the Internacional, so there was huge embarrassment as, as people <coughs> kind of mumbled, mumbled along, and you know, which is symbolic of the fact that nobody believed in this, in this, in this toxic uh, faith any longer by then. So I, I think the, he was among the last true believers. Yes. Was there any? Uh, well, we know that the French were somewhat susceptible uh, to the propaganda machine. The French, mm -hmm. yes indeed, yes. But did anybody French go as far as field and uh, become uh, you know, Traders an agent? Agents? Uh, I expect so, I expect so. The French were among the slowest to disavow Stalin. Right. But I, I think it was, I think with Sartre, for example, I think it was the, the 56 uprising that it was very hard after '56, and and seeing those those um, Soviet tanks rolling into Budapest and 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 crushing, you know, a very amateurish, uh, basically a student uh, uprising. It was very hard to say that the Soviet system was propped up by ideas mm -hmm. rather than tanks. No, so no, nobody that you know of was. Maybe that should be my next book. <laughs> Another gruesome end. <laughs> Simon. Um, given that you've spent all this time studying KGB's methods, how has that shaped your view of recent news events? My views on recent. Uh, yes, given, given that you are. Yes, that, that I'm now an, an expert. On <laughs> uh, well, I'm. I'm. Uh, to be honest with you, I'm horrified. Um, I. I um, I'm I'm trying to work on another book, but I can't because because my hair's on fire because I can't stay away from uh, I'm online all day. Uh, re yeah, but I mean, what have okay, you done so about I, the KGB? Yeah, apart from my personal, <laughs> what do I think of the KGB? No, no. I think can the KGB plus a change? <laughs> Nothing <laughs> is surprising about this, really. I mean, they, they, they are still looking for opportunities, and man, do they have a huge one here. And, and you know, we have, a, we have a, well, he's better than a Manchurian candidate, but he's, he's uh, because he is um, burdened by no knowledge of history, so everything is happening for the first time in, in Trump world, it's all stunning and new, and... Uh, you know, Putin uh, looks like a manly man. 
Um, he doesn't. He doesn't know that this is a, this. This man has never been anything but a KGB agent, and and that that we do not share similar values or aspirations. It doesn't mean that that we shouldn't engage with them. Hell no. We uh, on the contrary, but um, but to assume that um, you know we can that that we see eye to eye on anything. Um, is is incredibly dangerous. So the KGB is just doing what it's always done, and and they've never they've never been so lucky. <laughs> yes. When he is young and idealist, yes. why <coughs> can't he become a communist a fighter mm. uh, on the social political level in the states? Mm -hmm. I mean, work uh, like a socialist or a communist yes. to better, better the conditions it, yeah. of the workers. Such a, such a good question, mm -hmm. such a sure. smart question. Mm -hmm. And the answer is that he had been so radicalized that he, he thought that America was beyond salvation mm -hmm. and that capitalism was rotten. And indeed, capitalism was on its knees. Mm -hmm. Um, and and that uh, America had run out of ideas, and here was this shining triumph, triumphant Russian Revolution, because all he and and his his ilk knew of Russia was from Russian propaganda, and so here was this this revolution that that well, that seemed to be working <coughs> extremely well, and so let's bring it home, and uh, and that's what the, they were. That's what they were doing. They were they were kind of a, kind of a, a, a government in exile um, until Roosevelt came in and, and really ran through these these radical uh, uh, legislative this radical re uh, legislative agenda, which turned the nation around very quickly. And by the way, also lifted prohibition, which helped a lot <laughs> in the first week. Yeah. Yes, Miranda. Yeah, um, the issue of radicalization is such a um, yes. you know, current issue, especially here in France, we talk about it all the time. Did you gain any insight into, A, how does one spot a person who's becoming mm -hmm. radicalized, and what are the solutions? Because if somebody like your protagonist who went mm -hmm. to Harvard, who was obviously intelligent, yes, who, who was given all the means to right. be able to you know, um, judge, and mm -hmm. he could... It, it was something that was much more visceral than any kind of intellectual exercise yes. for him. So did you, did you spot any means of de-radicalizing um, people? Because this is what everybody wants to know today, know. is how do, we de how do we bring them back? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, a, it, it's the toughest thing to bring people back. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, it's uh, because you develop, it's almost like an addiction, because not only uh, is suddenly everything in your life explained, uh, not just yes. politics, but all your social problems, and and these people tend to be sort of social misfits too, and and, and now they they have comrades, they have a family, they have a purpose, and plus another thing is that there is empowerment in a life of uh, secrecy, you know when 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 his colleagues in the State Department would brush past him and say oh there's there's old Noel you know shambling you know he could say. Mm. I know, they so. don't really know mm -hmm. what I'm really doing, and mm -hmm. so so there. That's very empowering. Mm -hmm. um, so I, you know, uh, as the New York subway keeps telling us, if you see something, say something. <laughs> uh, I mean, um, you know, if people start behaving uh, strangely, um, we we really can't afford not to not to. Notice, uh, not necessarily call the fleek, but but you know reach out somehow, and and the whole field could have been turned around if if uh, I you know his his father um, I think would have would have uh, played a very strong influence in in turning him into you know a great uh, peace activist or instead of an assassin, but yes. You mentioned that your research was based on um, the KGB files and yes. the security. How right. did you get access to that? Well, I've done prior work in the um, in the in the archives, so I kind of know my way around. Um, 
And the KGB um, is now virtually closed, but it was open for a period of time. Um, and um, actually, a colleague of mine got a lot of these um, uh, no field um, cable traffic, which you'll see in the book, um, before they closed it down. So that was uh, lucky. I got I got a few things that um, uh, out of the KGB now, but not very much. But there was a period before Putin closed down. Um, but a lot of this, um, lucky for me because I speak <coughs> Hungarian, a lot of this was in the Hungarian secret police archives because that's where he was tortured and and that's where he was uh, held and that and and uh, um, and my father and he had the same interrogator so my father also learned stuff from the interrogator and by the way um, if anybody has a shred of doubt about about Alger Hiss's uh, guilt you won't when you finish reading this uh, there's not a scintilla of doubt that he was a uh, hardcore. He went. He he died, as you all know, um, denying. Um, and uh, there's there's quite a quite a famous interview that David Remnick did with him um, at the end of his life, where where um, he gives himself away a little bit. I, I cite them, but he he denies, and his son sadly to this day denies it as does Victor Navasky, the editor of the nation. <laughs> so, uh, so you know, pe people have invested a lot in, in, in Hiss's innocence, but why? no more. Yes? Um, to bring you back to today and Putin, uh, yeah. the connection with the Republican campaign people and mm -hmm. Russian mm -hmm. communication, do you have any hope that the journalists and, uh, and the investigation that I hope it's still on yes. will ever be coming out with information because as far as I can tell, when I tried following that story, yeah. uh, it went to a, a man who was the British spy's contact in Moscow who was found dead in his car. <laughs> yes, uh, that's so very, that's massively inconvenient. Very much like <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes, yeah, no, I, I you know, it's... Um, the reason that that Trump is going after journalists is, uh, I mean, it's a, it's right out of um, the the uh, autocrats playbook. It's right out of Putin's playbook. You you um, you need first of all to uh, to to uh, discredit the messengers, and he's mm -hmm. doing that. And and um, I used to go every fall to Moscow uh, on behalf of the committee to protect journalists too try to make interventions on behalf of beleaguered Soviet, not Soviet, I'm not starting to call it Soviet again, um, <laughs> Russian, Russian journalists. But you know what, they're, we don't do that anymore because there's so few of them left. Same in Turkey, by the way. So, you know, these are, these are um, I, I, I keep asking myself, what didn't people do in the 30s, you know, in, in uh, when, when, Clouds were this dark that we should be doing. Well, yes, how would you suggest that we support yeah. journalists? Uh, oh well, <laughs> we have a few of them right here. Um, we have the New York Times and we have the Financial Times and we have the New Yorker with us. So, um, any suggestions, uh, Rachel? How should how subscribe, should subscribe? Be, subscribe. Subscribe. Yes. Is there an organization? Yes, there is an organization. Yes. yes, yes. It's called the Committee to Protect Journalists. And so, so yes, and it's on. Be... It's all online, and and it would be much appreciated. And I have to tell you that Meryl Streep gave us a tremendous shout out at the Golden Globe, um, and that was that resulted in. Sweet. Yes. No. I think it's our duty. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So However cool. annoying the pre the media are, um, it's the only thing that stands between us and uh, the dictator's wish fulfillment. Yes. He seems to have such a strong following that no matter what he does, they don't <laughs> see anything wrong with this. Right. It is bizarre, it's isn't it? It's bizarre. Yeah. It's like they've that. all drunk the, the Kool-Aid that, yeah. that, that uh, Noel Field yeah. drank, mm -hmm. and they don't want to know. And they love the fact that 
that we're so upset. <laughs> I think that's a part of the appeal too. Mm -hmm. But but we, we you know we have no choice but to but to stay solidaire mm -hmm. and uh, and strong and not you know not not skulk off and cultivate our gardens. Although we have to do that too. But, yes. You might do. I think uh, if you look uh, before the 30s mm -hmm. at um, <clears throat> Joseph Conrad's book, Under Western Eyes, yes. I mean, I uh, if you don't take into account that uh, Joseph Conrad was actually talking about the Tsarist regime, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it sounds exactly like yes. Stalinist uh, Russia. Yes. And, I feel, yes. and then Putin again is just recreating the Soviet Union, morally speaking. And, uh, Absolutely. There's a sort of eternal Russia about it. Um, yes, yes. And you know that because you're an intelligent, well read person. But we have elected a man who knows no history and, and who <coughs> thinks that, that history is for fools and knaves. Well, I, 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 I'm not. I don't know much about him, but to me he sounds like a very bitter person, someone who um, <clears throat> just uh, mm -hmm. has a chip on his shoulder. He's born with a chip on his shoulder. Huge, yes. Huge as he would say. <laughs> Huge. Huge. <laughs> yes, yes. No, uh, absolutely. I think I, I have a close friend who's a, who's a psychiatrist who gave me a list of uh, half a dozen uh, <laughs> conditions that he genuinely suffers from, and none of it is good for us. Uh, so it's, it's uh, we, we're living in, in dangerous times. This gentleman and then you, because you've had one. Yes, yes. Thank you very much. Um, I, I've got a two-part question. First, what do you think espionage looks like today? So, if, mm. who is the null field of, of today? Mm. Um, and in, in, a, in a cyber world, do you still need null fields? Uh, those kind of people. Very, very good question. And, and secondly, what um, in the radicalization? I mean, we we spoke about ISIS, but what what kind of hook would you hang on today to 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 spy for Putin? You know, if it's not an ideology, is it a what? What do you think? If if we move well, back towards the Cold yeah. War, what what would actually inspire people? What would people? be the mm -hmm. what would be the the moving force to mm -hmm. capture these impressionable people? Well, I think in the case of uh, Russia, it's Mother Russia and uh, mm -hmm. historic Russia and the humiliation that Russia suffered uh, at the hands <coughs> of the West um, uh, since the end of. Uh, the Soviet Empire, and uh, and that's a very powerful thing. I have Russian friends who are otherwise quite reasonable people, who um, who you know at that point when when you start talking about you know what they're doing in Ukraine, um, that's part of historic Russia, and um, you know I I uh, it's happening in my own uh, homeland of Hungary, of course, um, massively. And and um, uh, Orban, Viktor Orban, the prime minister of Hungary, was was I, I think among the first to congratulate Trump. Mm -hmm. And and uh, and and they they uh, you know they are in some ways kindred spirits. So it's a it's a worldwide phenomenon. If if. Uh, if Hungary weren't in the in the hands of such a tin pot dictator, I would be looking for Danube front property uh, for the next few years. But but let's face it, there's no escape because you know France is about to have um, critical elections, and let's hope that goes the right way. But it's uh, you know we 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 need to do some. Uh, uh, I, I, I wrote a piece last week in which I tried to channel uh, Richard Holbrook for what, what he would be doing because he was such an activist diplomat. And, uh, and one thing he would be doing is rallying Democrats and, and urging them to tear up their old position papers because clearly um, we, we missed a lot of signals. And, and we were kind of on automatic pilot, thinking we were, we were on the right and we were ascendant. Well, it turns out we weren't. 
Um, yes, sir. It, seem, it seems to me that uh, Trump was brilliant in using the social networks to Absolutely. make his points. Yeah. And I don't think we found an anecdote for that. Uh, well, I this think is the we're going to have to learn how to use those social networks to yes. counter his uh, nonsense. Yes, yes. And I didn't quite. Uh, sorry, I didn't I'm quite sorry. answer um, whether whether we still even need a uh, Noel Fields. I, I I maintain that we do because I think that, that at the end of the day, human intelligence is is still paramount, and and um, and. Um, social media have, uh, has, has exposed its dark side in this election in a way that it didn't in the, in the um, election of Obama, on the contrary. So I think we're alert to that now, but, but I think that um, social media have a, have a lot of house cleaning to do too, and I think we have to um, hold them to that. But when you look at, at the sort of evil genius in the Trump White House, Steve Bannon, I mean, it's, he, you know, he's not about... Uh, cyber anything, he's about, um, well, some really bad ideas and, and, um, and a, a, a very bad person. I don't want to say more than that, but, but um, and, now, um, and now incredibly powerful and we're all waiting for those famous checks and balances to kick in. Um, but they're very slow to kick in, um, so we have to, we, you know, we all have a role to play, and it's more than voting every four years. I think I think that's the that's the uh, most urgent message is that everybody has to do, you know, everybody has their own uh, platform, um, and and we, but human, it's still about human beings. I wonder if the schools in America still teach rationality. <laughs> no, but seriously, yes. because they, people have been believing unbelievable things. Yes. There might be a problem in the education yes, system. I totally agree with you. Because I the first thing education does is no magic thinking yes. and rash, rationality. Yes, no, you're absolutely right. Before mathematics and I don't know what, uh, first yeah. to think rationally. I, I think that we're coming to terms with the downside of, um, of the information overload age, where just because we know a lot doesn't mean we know we understand anything, and and or or or, or know how to think. So we, we have the same problem in Europe. I mean, people are becoming radicalized also in spite yeah, of going yeah, through the yeah. you know, Education Nationale laïque and yeah, it's yeah. something's oh, it's, not functioning. It's a rubbish. Yeah. 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 Yes, no but, we're, but we're not helpless and we're not yet living under, you know, a supreme no. commander. But, um, but, but I, I, I think it's, it's time for those of us who took way too many things for granted um, to bestir ourselves and, and, um, and, and, you know, each in our, each in our own way, not, um, not yield. And I think power to, to those who, who are, are, are not hampered by good manners and, and thoughtfulness and all the, all the, the, the liberal uh, traps, if I can call them that, you know, where we, where we um, I, think, I think actually um, my party, the Democratic Party, is, it has been way too polite and passive in reacting. And I think that day is over for now. Maybe we'll get back to that period where we could um, be gentlemen. I mean, when Noel Field went into the State Department, um, the Secretary of State of the day said, gentlemen don't read each other's mail. And so how easy was it for him to, to spy? Because classified documents were lying around. Um, so, you know, we, we in a way, we, we, um, we have to learn to be less liberal in our in our attitudes during during this period um, and and toughen up uh, because the times call for that unfortunately anyway you've been a wonderful audience thank you so much for your attention